Got it. Got it. Yeah. All right. So we are recording just for everybody to know that's on the call right now. And um, I would like to welcome everybody to our very first AWRA um, online webinar. I'm Kendra Kaiser. I'm a vice president this year. Um, on the call, on the phone, we also have Kathy Peter and Mike Schubert. Mike Schubert's our president. And today we have Austin Baldwin and Monica Hubbard joining us to talk about water quality, um, both in Idaho and across the country. Uh, so just a quick update. Um, we this is our first uh, online webinar, but we are planning on having more of them in the next couple of months. So keep an eye out on the AWRA calendar. You can go to awraidaho.org and it has um, all of our events on there as well as some partner organizations and their events that are going on. And you can even uh, link the calendar with your, uh, your personal calendar and have it show up on, on Gmail, which I find really helpful. Um, so today, uh, Austin is going to talk first. He's a hydrologist with the USGS. He got his master's at the University of Texas at Austin in structural geology, and he found his way to the USGS and became really interested in water quality. So now that he's in Idaho, he's involved with a range of field-based studies of surface water quality related to the occurrence and toxicity of organic con contaminants in streams, microplastics, and the use of real-time sensors for development of relationships with various water quality constituents. Uh, so he's going to talk for about 15-20 uh, minutes and then we'll have uh, some time for questions after he talks. And then afterwards, uh, Monica Hubbard is going to give a presentation as well, and I'll give her an introduction um, right before she talks. And she's going to be talking about some emerging contaminants of concern um, and some policy implications for that as well. So we'll go ahead and have Austin, you can share your screen and we'll get started. All right, you seeing my screen, Kendra? Yep. Oh, I just muted you, I think, on accident. Um, sorry about that, Austin. Hold on just a second. Uh, oh, can okay. you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, OK. All right, well, thanks for everybody for tuning in. Um, so I'm going to give a an overview talk on, on microplastics in mostly in freshwater environments. Um, we, up until just like 2013, we knew almost nothing about microplastics in freshwater. Um, we, microplastics in oceans had been studied for a decade or two prior to that, but um, we knew almost nothing about microplastics in freshwater environments. And in 2013, a paper came out on microplastics in the Great Lakes. And uh, that was one of the very first on on, in microplastics in fresh water, and it was really, in my opinion, the first paper that that brought public, national public attention to the topic of microplastics in general. Um, that paper got a lot of press. Some of you may remember that one. Um, it it caused several states to ban the use of microbeads, plastic microbeads, in personal care products like toothpastes and face scrubs. Um, and in 2015, it, it led to um, Obama signing the Microbead-Free micro Waters Act, uh, which, which prohibited the use of plastic microbeads in things like toothpaste and face scrubs. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot more to microplastics than just microbeads. Um, so if I can advance, here we go. So I'm going to talk about kind of where we are now, you know, we're five or eight years into um, learning about microplastics in fresh water. So I'm going to talk about types, sources, pathways of microplastics, biological effects, um, and provide some examples of occurrence and biological uptake in freshwater environments. And then I'm going to close with um, a few slides on microplastic atmospheric deposition, which 
um, is it something we're just starting to learn about, um, but that I, I find pretty fascinating and depressing. <laughs> All right, so first, what are microplastics? Microplastics are any plastic particle um, from about five millimeters at the upper end down to 100 nanometers at the lower end. Um, so that includes quite a bit of quite a large size range and a lot of includes a lot of different things. Um, less than 100 nanometers, we get into nanoplastics, and that's um, nanoplastics. We know that they're out there, um, but they're actually that's so small that we don't even have a, a good way of measuring nanoplastics in the environment. Um, and actually, microplastics. We're, we're still just kind of seeing the iceberg. Right now, most labs can only um, measure down to about 100 microns. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of microplastic and nanoplastic out there that, that we can't yet measure. Um, but we do know that you know, from looking at, at these sizes here, the, the number of particles increase exponentially as you get to smaller and smaller sizes. Um, so so for, for what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm, I'm primarily talking about this range, five millimeters down to about 100 microns. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of different types of microplastics. Um, microplastics really should be thought of as, as a contaminant class rather than a single contaminant because microplastics vary in size and shape and polymer type. And then they also can vary in the, the, t the chemicals that are sorbed to their surfaces. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of studies try to characterize microplastics by their, by their shape or morphology or type, kind of using those, those words interchangeably. So different types that people talk about are lines from things like nets and ropes, fishing line, things like that. Beads and pellets or anything that are spherical or, or semi-spherical. These are things from personal care products, also from pre-production pellets, which, which is like raw material for making other plastic items. Foams from things like foam coffee cups and takeout containers, packing foam, etc. Films from plastic bags and wrappers. And then Fragments are kind of a, it's kind of a catch-all category for just broken up pieces of, of larger plastic debris. Fibers from clothing, textiles, carpet, upholstery, and tire particles, um, which can come from from tire wear itself, from tires themselves, but also from crumb rubber, which is used on athletic fields, which is what you're seeing right here. Uh, like on AstroTurf. Um, also rubberized asphalt, which is um, kind of a fascinating thing that I just learned about somewhat recently, where they actually grind up tires and mix it into asphalt for roads, um, which apparently improves some of the qualities of the, of the asphalt, but it also is something to do with all our old tires, which is good, but um, then as that breaks down, those particles wash into streams which is not so good. Okay, so what, what risk do microplastics pose to aquatic organisms? That's a really big question right now, and one that I would say is, is still kind of um, to be determined. Um, organisms are definitely ingesting microplastics. You know, there have been studies of over 100 species showing that organisms are ingesting microplastics, and that's everything from invertebrates, corals, things like that, up to fish and birds and marine mammals. Uh, the, the potential risks of ingestion are both mechanical and chemical. So by mechanical, I mean an organism eats the plastic and, and the plastic clogs their feeding appendage or it creates like a stomach ulcer or it, it gives the organism a false sense of satiation meaning they're, you know, they, they think they're eating and their stomach is full, but there's no nutritional value. So that's the mechanical, mechanical risks. On the chemical risk side, plastics have a lot of additives in them. 
to give them different properties. These include things like flame retardants, alkyl phenols, antimicrobials, plasticizers, styrenes, antioxidants like bisphenol A. Um, a lot of these are toxic and or endocrine disrupting. And the concern is that if an organism eats the plastic that, that these chemicals can, can leach out into the organism. In addition to what's, what's manufactured into the plastic, there are chemicals that sorb onto and accumulate on the plastic when the plastic is floating around out on the river or the lake. Um, plastics, it turns out, are really good at attracting chemicals from in the water column. A lot of, a lot of chemicals don't like just free floating in the water. They want to attach to something. Um, so chemicals like PCBs, DDT, PAHs, pathogens, metals, these things will sorb onto the surface of the plastic. And so again, the concern is if the plastic is eaten during the, di the digestive process in the stomach, are those chemicals stripped off and do they get transferred to the organism? So like I said, this is a, a really big topic right now. There's a lot of studies, uh, you know, studies coming out every week about um, exposing this or that organism to this or that plastic and what happens, right? Um, some, of the, some of the common effects that people report are reproductive related effects, reduction and reproduction, reduction and reproduction, like always trips me up. Toxic effects to the liver, um, at really small sizes, plastics can actually pass through the gut wall and into the circulatory system and cause cell damage. Um, I will note that these are almost all lab studies where they can control and, um, and measure these things. In the, in the environment, it's actually, the effects are pretty unknown because it's, it's really hard to do a controlled study in the environment. So pathways to the, to the environment include wastewater treatment plant discharges. So when you wash your clothing, when you flush a toilet, you know, of course that water goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, a lot of that water contains microplastics, especially like in your wash water, your, your, your laundry water. A single garment can shed thousands of plastic fibers when you wash it. So those fibers go to the treatment plant. The treatment plant is actually pretty good at removing those, those particles, not because it was designed to do that, but because a lot of plastics uh, will settle out if given the opportunity. So for, so for like all of those fibers will settle out into the, into the biosolids or the sludge. Um, but a few percent of what comes in usually makes it out the other side of the treatment plant and into the river. And then you have that biosolids that is just chock full of microplastics. And in a lot of cases, that those biosolids are land applied, um, as is shown here. So you have this really concentrated mix of, of <laughs> poop and microplastics um, getting applied on fields. And then it can be picked up by the wind, or it can be um, washed into the nearby stream. Stormwater runoff is another pathway to the environment. Um, all those things that accumulate on the street, including tire particles, um, get washed into, washed off the street and into the nearby stream um, during storms. And then the last pathway is atmospheric deposition. This is, this, this is not a comprehensive list of pathways, but um, I'm going to come back to the atmospheric depos deposition topic at the end, so I won't talk about that for now. All right, so I'm gonna spend a, just a few slides on occurrence in um, freshwater environments. So I'm gonna give a few examples on microplastics in surface water, in sediment, and in fish and shellfish. So this was a study that we did in 2014, or yeah, I think it was 2014. We sampled 29 different Great Lakes tributaries um, with a range of, of land uses from dominantly urban basins to dominantly ag basins to dominantly natural basins. And we, we sampled each of them four times, two during base flow conditions and two during storm flow conditions for microplastics. 
And this, this figure kind of summarizes the, the results. The, the top plot here are the average concentrations that we measured each site. The colors are um, the plastic type. And then, and then the bottom plot here is just the, the basin land use. They're, so they're ordered by least to most urban, left to right. So a few things to take away from this. Um, concentrations, you know, we're, we're pretty commonly in the one to 10 plastic particles per cubic meter range, up to, we had up to 32 particles per cubic meter. Um, you notice as you look across this top figure, that you see orange kind of all the way across it and pretty evenly across it, both the agricultural and natural sites and the really urban sites have about the same amount of um, fibers in the samples. Um, we actually, we saw there was, there was absolutely no correlation between um, land use and fiber concentration. There were correlations between um, these other types of plastics like fragments and foams and films and land use, but fibers we saw everywhere at pretty similar concentrations, which to us suggested, well, maybe, maybe fibers are not, you know, isolated to urban areas and maybe there's a different pathway that, for fibers to be reaching these more remote areas. Um, I also want to point out that pellets and beads made up a very small amount of, of the plastics that we measured. And this was, these samples were collected before the, the Micro Bead Free Waters Act. So, um, so you know, we, what we took away from this was that micro beads, um, despite all the attention that they got in the press and they, they got their own act from Congress, they're actually a pretty small picture of, of the microplastics issue. Um, and these concentrations are pretty similar to what we've seen in other places around the US, including Lake Mead, the Mississippi River, the Delaware River, St. Croix, uh, et cetera. Okay, so moving on to sediment. So like I said before, a lot of plastics are, are negatively buoyant or very close to neutrally buoyant. So if given the opportunity, a lot of them will settle out. Obviously that depends on their polymer type, um, but a lot of them will settle out if given the chance. So it's important to look in sediment for microplastics. So here's just a few, a few plots of three different locations across the US, Lake Mead, the Delaware National Scenic River, and the Milwaukee streams in the Milwaukee area. Just to give you an idea of, of concentrations in sediment and, and the types of plastics that we see in the sediment. Um, and note that this, the y-axis scale is, is the same on the first two, but is, is different for the Milwaukee plot. Um, so you see that in general, we still see a lot of fibers shown in orange. Fibers are still kind of ubiquitous across sites, um, like they are in water. Um, but one, one particle type that kind of jumps out on these plots, partly because it's bright pink, but partly because it makes up a large percentage of some samples, is tire particles. Um, some of these sites, we saw a lot of tire particles, up to you know, over 5,000 tire particles per kilogram dry weight of sediment, um, which is not great news because tire particles contain a lot of metals and other um, chemicals that are not great for aquatic organisms. Um, shifting now to biological uptake, so these are plots of microplastics in fish, and this is the fish gut, um, just the fish gut. So these are the Delaware River on the left and Lake Mead on the right. The top set of plots are for smallmouth bass, and then the bottom ones are white suckers and carp. Um, so you, see, you can see in these two locations, concentrations in fish are they kind of range in the five to 20 particles per organism range pretty, pretty commonly, um, and almost all fibers. 
is what we see in the fish. And then lastly, shellfish, again, at Delaware River and Lake Mead. Um, first, look, we'll look at Delaware River. So Delaware River, actually, we sampled the eastern elliptio in the Delaware River. Um, and they were actually pretty, pretty low concentrations. About half of them, we didn't, we didn't find any plastics in. And, and then the most we saw was five plastics per, per organism, which is pretty low. Lake Mead was a little bit different. So quagga mussels um, at one of the locations had averaged about 12 pieces of plastic per quagga mussel, um, which you, I think you, you're familiar with quagga mussels. They're pretty small little organ, you know, they're like one to two centimeter um, mussels. So 12 pieces of plastic in that little thing is, is quite a bit. And then we also sampled a few Asian clams um, these are a little bit bigger than quaggas, but you know, not much. Maybe maybe one and a half or two, twice the size of a quagga. Um, and these were these had a lot higher concentrations. One of them had about 30 pieces of plastic in it, and one of them had about 110 pieces of plastic pieces of plastic in it. So pretty surprising, pretty surprising concentrations in the Asian clams and the quaggas at Lake Mead. And again, like with fish we see almost all fibers in shellfish. Okay, so now, now shifting to atmospheric deposition as a pathway to microplastics reaching remote environments. Um, so this is something, like I said, we're, we're just starting to understand a little bit about. Um, the first few publications on this have just come out in the last couple of years. So I was, I was part of a study um, that, that came out in 2019 that was looking at, um, it was actually not designed for microplastics. It was designed to look at like nutrients in rain samples. Um, it's like, I'm missing a slide here, but anyway, it, this, was, this was a study in the Denver area, um, the Denver Boulder Front Range area and up to Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, there was a site at Lock Vale at an elevation of 10,000 feet in Rocky Mountain National Park. And they had these samplers designed to collect rain so that when it started raining, this lid would flip open and this bucket would collect rain. And then when it stopped raining, the lid would flip closed. And again, this was designed to, to sample for nutrients. So it wasn't designed as a microplastic study. But when Greg Weatherby, who was running the study, he filtered this water through these filters and he started looking at them under the microscope. He started seeing all this plastic in the samples. Um, all kinds of different colors. Mostly he was seeing fibers, um, but he was also seeing uh, fragments, colorful fragments like this red one and this blue one down here. Um, so he, he started looking at his samples more closely and he found, he found plastics in over 90% of his rain samples. More at urban sites than at the more remote rural sites, um, but even up at Rocky Mountain National Park at 10,000 feet, he was seeing plastics in the samples. And he even saw what we're pretty sure are tire particles in these samples. So this is a scanning electron microscope image of a particle from Rocky Mountain National Park rain sample that um, we're, we're pretty confident this is a tire particle based on the, the chemical makeup, um, which is it's just kind of baffling how, you know, then, so there's a the question of is it, is it just from roads up there or is it from, um, you know, air masses coming up from Denver? Um, we don't know that yet. So around the same time, we were, we were doing a pilot study of microplastics in um, glacial snowpack in North Cascades. So we, we were already on to this idea that the atmosphere might be a, an important pathway to remote areas. And we thought, well, a good place to test that would be um, a high alpine environment where there are no other sources. There's no other, you know, there's no roads washing off into these areas. There's people are not up here. 
So if we if we take a core of um, this snowpack up here, that should tell us what's coming out of the atmosphere. So in 2018, we collected the first core, um, went down several meters, and then melted that water, and then analyzed it for microplastics. And then we took a couple more in 2019. So we only have three samples so far. So this is a, a, a small study so far, but um, pretty fascinating results. So here are the results. Um, so concentrations have, have ranged from for these snow core samples from about 10 to about 30 particles per liter of, of snow melt equivalent, snow water equivalent. Um, which if you recall the concentrations we were seeing in rivers, this is 100 to 1,000 times greater than concentrations we were seeing in the rivers. And this is, this is using the same, you know, we're looking at the same sizes of particles. These are analyzed by all the same lab. Um, so these results are, are in every way comparable to the results that we were seeing in, that I was showing in rivers. So these, these concentrations are, are right comparable to what we see in like urban runoff, like right off of the street into the storm sewer concentrations. That's, that's the same as what we're seeing here in these alpine glaciers. So um, kind of, I mean, we were really surprised by these numbers. Um, we thought we would see plastics up there, but we didn't, we didn't imagine they would be this high. Um, so we're, we're trying to get funding to do some more work up there to, to try to understand this a little bit more. So in conclusion, plastics and especially microfibers are not limited to urban areas, but appear to be ubiquitous in aquatic environments pretty much everywhere we look. Um, and they are being ingested by aquatic organisms, though the effects, I would say, are still pretty poorly understood. And atmospheric deposition appears to be an important pathway to aquatic environments. And in remote areas, atmospheric deposition may be the primary pathway. And um, I want to acknowledge several folks at USGS, Park Service, Sherry Mason at SUNY Fredonia, and, and funding. And I will take questions. I can't remember if we're going to do questions right now or if we're waiting on questions, but that's all I have. Awesome. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, we can take some questions now um, just for a few minutes and then we'll have Monica um, go ahead and then hopefully we'll have time for some more questions for both of y'all after. Um, we People can either chat a question into the chat window um, and or you can, I'm not positive if people can unmute themselves. If somebody wants to try, I don't know, Maggie, if maybe you want to try to unmute yourself. Usually there's, okay, great. I can see that some of you can. So you can jump in and ask questions. Austin, uh, Brett Smith, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I, I've got my own consultancy, Environmental Compliance Associates here in Eagle. Uh, I, I don't do your kind of work, but I'm intrigued by sampling and analysis and all that type of thing. And the glaciers, could it possibly be that high concentrations because of the, you know, the slow accumulating nature of glaciers where maybe it's a repository, if you will, that kind of holds things over time and maybe that's what gets that concentration so high? So, so we were sampling just the annual snowpack and we weren't even getting through the first oh. you know, the full yeah. annual snowpack. Um, so I think, I think we were typically sampling a few meters, um, and the annual snowpack was, you know, more like eight meters, something like that. So, so what we were, what we were measuring was just from that year. Huh. Interesting. Thank you. That's interesting. I have a quick one, Austin. Um, it's really interesting that you found so few microbeads um, as um, a subset of the microplastics that you were sampling. Is it possible that they could be um, like decomposing or getting smaller since they're already on the small end such that they're below the detection limit? 
I don't think they're decomposing. Um, the the size though might be might be part of it, Kendra. So microbeads vary in size, you know, depending on what they're being used for. They can be pretty small. So it's it's possible that the nets that we've used, um, you know, we've used a variety of of mesh sizes. So this picture kind of shows not really great, but shows how we collect in water. So we we basically drag a net through the water. And the net, you know, sometimes sometimes in, in the earlier studies we use like a 300 micron mesh net. Um, more recently I've I've switched to a hundred micron net. Um, but some of the microbeads can be smaller than those sizes. So it, it's possible that some of them are are passing through the net. Um, but you know that that 2013 Great Lakes study that like really brought microbeads um, a lot of attention. That was using the same size mesh net. It was like a 330 mesh net, um, and it was actually the same. Like, I I was a co-author with with that woman on on subsequent studies. So like, it was the same lab, the same mesh size, same everything. Um, we just weren't seeing them in the rivers like like she saw in some of the Great Lakes samples. Interesting. Cool. Thanks. Austin, uh, do you mind if I ask a quick question? Do you know if uh, any like wastewater treatment plant operators or municipalities, if this is becoming an increasing concern to them? I might have missed that at the beginning. Yeah, I, um, so I don't know about, you know, how concerned they are about it. Um, I, I know that so I worked pretty closely with the wastewater treatment district, the sewerage district in Milwaukee when I when I lived and worked over there, and um, you know they were they were concerned about it, and they were concerned that that they were being blamed for like being a source of microplastics. Where you know I I always try to point out that they're not a source; they're a, a pathway, right? They're that we and our laundry and our products are the sources and and it's just passing through them <laughs> um, but you know if there's regulation like they could be they could be fingered for trying to regulate these things some sometime down the road so I think they're I think it's on their radar but you know for them to re-engineer to try to better capture these things I think is a pretty big lift um, so I my my impression is they're just kind of watching and, and seeing what happens. And like I said, they they are pretty good at removing, depending on the level of treatment, right? Um, but they can be pretty good at removing plastics, not because they're designed to do it, but just because of the nature of, of how they treat water and because a lot of plastics are negatively buoyant. Um, you know, some studies report that like 99% of the plastics coming into the treatment plants are captured. Hmm. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks, uh, Austin. And we will switch over to Monica and make sure to have questions for her. And then if anyone has other questions that pop up um, as Monica is talking, you can always um, put them in the chat window. So Monica Thank Hubbard. Oh, yeah. Monica Hubbard is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Policy and Administration here at Boise State. She received her master's and PhD from Oregon State University, and she, there she was researching the fate and transport of pharmaceutical drugs, their impacts, and public policy implications, as well as public knowledge and risk perceptions about Oregon water resources. Um, she's continuing to do some of that work here in Idaho as well. Um, and at Boise State, she teaches a range of courses on environmental politics, public policy, and policy analysis, and uh, thanks for, for joining us, Monica. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Sorry, I'm a little late. I, um, with the end of the semester, I lost my Zoom link, among many things I've lost. But uh, if anybody has problems hearing me, just uh, speak up and I'll, I'll see what I can do. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the nice intro, Kendra. And she's absolutely right, Assistant Professor at Boise State University. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of my research and that's around active pharmaceutical ingredients, but myself and Dr. Steph Witt are actually examining more about uh, contaminants of emerging concern 
in the Western United States and how municipalities are uh, dealing with that, if they are at all. So uh, I will just kind of fly through this a bit because I think we're uh, a little short. And I want to kind of get to the, the fun stuff, which is uh, the policy issues associated with it. So if there are any objections, I'll go ahead and start. And maybe I will. Shit. Shoot, did I say that? Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, you already know what a contaminant of emerging concern is, so I won't go through that. But again, I'm going to talk about active pharmaceutical ingredients. And these are the ingredients that are left over and are stay active in the environment after an extended period of time. They just essentially don't break down and uh, they cause problems. Again, I'm just going to fly through that. Uh, some of the main sources of APIs are hospitals, of course, uh, care facilities. Uh, cute veterinary clinics, uh, devil goats or agriculture, as we like to call them, uh, schools. Uh, there's a lot of drugs that actually go in, prescribed drugs that go to schools, uh, residential households. And that's kind of the one that we're really interested in. Uh, what are the concerns? Why do we care about unused pharmaceutical drugs? accidental poisoning. Uh, shout out to Kendra for letting me use her photograph from uh, grade school. Nice mullet. <laughs> yeah. uh, misuse of pharmaceutical drugs. We've all heard about the opioid epidemic. 80% uh, of opioid addicts actually started with uh, prescribed pharmaceutical drugs, either prescribed to them or somebody else. And that's what got them started. Uh, and this is what we're interested in, right? Uh, water quality. This is just a map of a 2000 uh, survey from USGS, and I think they surveyed about 190 or 100 streams throughout the US and found uh, APIs in 80% of them. And again, that's an old study, and that's what they found. And then soil quality. Soil, these are starting to uh, build up in soil. And a lot of that is due to reclaimed wastewater for irrigation and then biosolids used for uh, fertilizer. And then, you know, with water quality, now we start looking at the effects of, on organisms. And I think, I, I imagine a lot of you probably are heard about these, but of course, uh, retinoids impact uh, the skin of frogs and other, other uh, organisms, um, it's starting to build up in birds of prey and impacting them. And then of course, the one we always hear about are the fish. And I think uh, a study on the Potomac, uh, an old study found that like 80% of the fish started having uh, sexual uh, abnormalities associated with pharmaceutical drugs. So it's, it's there, of course, and then human health. That's the one that's kind of up in the air and it's difficult to study, but the, uh, some studies have already found human health impacts uh, to uh, kidneys and livers, in particular to children, uh, young children. And then of course, there's something called nocebo effect. And that's where people think they're exposed to something and then they start having health impacts from that. And then I don't know if anybody else has heard about this, the meth gator issue that came out of Florida last year, and uh, it was pretty entertaining. So, and then of course, uh, other impacts are, uh, and didn't show up, but high school musicals, those do show up because of too many drugs. So what is the scope? How much of this are we seeing? The amount of drugs prescribed are skyrocketing. In the United States, there were, uh, I think about, let me see if I have that data on me, like 19 billion prescriptions. I'm sorry, that's totally wrong. About 4 billion prescriptions in the United States. That's just from retail pharmacies. It doesn't include commercial hospitals and mail. It's just, those are the uh, small amount. Like in Idaho, you know, we're looking at about 19 million prescriptions a year, and that's about 10 per person. So there's a lot of prescriptions, and the amount are actually going up. So you're like, okay, what's what's the big deal with that? Well, the problem is studies have found that only 2% of Americans actually use 
all of their drugs. And then other studies have found, I should go through the slides, but about two thirds of prescription drugs are not used at all, or at least not in their entirety. So they're unused, which leads to the question, like what happens to all these drugs? Great question. And there have been numerous surveys with this. And uh, most of all, it looks like about 50 to 60% goes to the household trash and about a third goes directly into the sewer. And uh, we'll get to like, why can't they just take it to a pharmacy or give it away? It's, it's uh, actually illegal in most cases. So a lot of drugs and uh, they're not being used and they're being disposed. This is just a, a diagram, like what happens to these? And, and keep in mind, of course, it, it doesn't include uh, septic systems or biosolid applications. But essentially what happens, it gets, it goes in the trash and or the water, and then it ends up in surface water, groundwater, and then in marine waters. It's been found everywhere. And the, the, the trash, even though it sounds like a better option, and it is a better option than the sewer, uh, what happens with the trash, it goes to a landfill and then it, it ends up in a leachate. That leachate ends up either at a wastewater treatment plant uh, or groundwater or sometimes directly into surface water. So it's not a great option, it's just a slightly better option than flushing it down your toilet. Isn't this a fun, now we keep talking about toilets and wastewater. So now we'll get to kind of the, the fun part how are these regulated? Or are they regulated at all? And where are the regulatory challenges to trying to actually manage for these substances? You can't just keep them out of the water and they're starting to build up and cause problems. Uh, probably the biggest uh, issue right now or biggest challenge with managing these is uh, the C uh, Controlled Substances Act. And that essentially says with the Controlled Substances Act, if you have a controlled substance, which is about 20, 25% of prescription drugs, you can't take it, once you have control of it, it's out of the chain of control, meaning you can't just take it back to a pharmacy to have it disposed of properly. It's yours and you have it. You can't give it away and you're kind of stuck with it. And uh, it's, a, it's a great in theory, but it, it's causing a lot of problems for these these uh, governments who are trying to manage these drugs and keep them out of the water. That's one. The other is the Safe Drinking Water Act, which we've all heard of, which essentially is trying to keep the, the water safe. We're going to get back into that a little bit later. But that's kind of a, a big cloud looming over uh, drinking water and wastewater facilities. And uh, I I imagine somebody, numerous people on here probably work for these facilities and they might have heard about pharmaceutical drugs. So the best way of dealing with this is to keep the drugs out of the water in the first place. And the challenge with that is uh, we can't because of the Controlled Substances Act. And as a result, people either stockpile these drugs, which leave them uh, as opportunities for accidental poisoning or uh, intentional misuse or to dispose of them. And the options to dispose of them are trash or the sewer. So how have these been uh, kind of, I wouldn't say regulated, but what kind of responses have we seen? Uh, the best response would be at the federal level. The federal government um, from the very beginning did not want to address this. And uh, there's many reasons for that. Um, but the, the main one, of course, is politics. Uh, so as a result, which is fairly typical, when the federal government does not respond, there's a subnational response to uh, a major dilemma. And that's what we started seeing in the early 2000s. So what happened, and this is where the story really begins. Uh, in 2002, USGS puts out uh, their, the results from their survey and a lot of like municipalities and innovative local governments are like, holy crap, uh, if this is regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, we're kind of screwed. Uh, just like what Austin was discussing with those microcontaminants, these are, this is also a microcontaminant and the wastewater treatment plants are not designed to remove these. 
Uh, they can remove some, but not all. And in order for them to actually remove or deal with pharmaceuticals, they'd have to put in a tertiary treatment system, uh, often like maybe two different types of tertiary treatment. So they're, they're alarmed. Uh, some uh, innovative governments actually tried to put in programs to deal with this, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Uh, one in particular is Clark County, Washington, which is right on the, the Columbia River uh, or between Oregon and Washington. And they put in a program to keep drugs out of the system. And part of that, they were able to receive a waiver from the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, to uh, dispose of controlled substances. Again, the controlled substances is what keeps people from taking their drugs right now back to a pharmacy where they'll be incinerated. They can't do it. So they were able to get that and they got it going. It was great, uh, fairly successful, won several awards. And a late, little later, 2006, King County and Seattle, a little bigger fish if you look at it, also try to put in a program, and this program was a more secure program to ensure uh, controlled substances did not end up being misused or diverted. So they put in this program, and what happened? They asked for DEA for a waiver to collect controlled substances, just like Clark County was granted. The DEA said, No, you are not going to get a waiver. We're not going to give you one at all. This essentially led to the King County's program. It was still kind of successful, but not nearly as much. And it led to se severe cost increases to deal with the pharmaceutical drugs because they were not able to get the waiver. And this is fairly common uh, when local governments start innovating and having their own programs. The federal government feels like their turf is starting to be stepped on a little bit they'll come back and, and try to take control. And that's, this is just kind of an example of that. And you're actually starting to see that again right now with the COVID responses. Um, so King County uh, tried it and it, unfortunately costs went up, but this didn't stop some of these governments. And in between 2007 and 2010, numerous state legislators started introducing what we call product stewardship bills. And these bills essentially stated, hey, pharmaceutical manufacturers and uh, distributors, you are going to be responsible for putting in a program to collect pharmaceutical drugs from the public and where they can be incinerated. You're going to put it in and you're going to pay for it. Uh, none of these bills passed, but what you notice with this is a lot of like uh, politics. So interest groups like pharma and other pharmaceutical manufacturers would often testify and the narrative they used to kind of kill these bills including a lot of money uh, was uh, if we if we introduce these pol these stewardship bills it's going to raise the cost for drugs to elderly and the sick it uh, also there's really no science that shows that pharmaceutical drugs are in the water and that they cause problems and then, of course, if we have these bills, it's going to increase uh, climate change impacts. So you started noticing a lot of these bills popping up. They'd all fail. But what happened was pharma and other interest groups stepped up to the federal government looking for a federal program to try to prevent state programs that would essentially make them pay for these bills. So they started venue shopping and went to U.S. Congress, and out came the Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act of 2010. Uh, this particular act essentially said that, okay, we will allow residential, far, or, uh, residential pharmacies to start collecting uh, unused pharmaceutical drugs, including controlled substances. And of course, all these pharmacies have to do is change your DEA uh, status, uh, put in a secure disposal system, and then of course pay for it. Uh, sounds great in, in, in theory. Uh, 
these, uh, the rulemaking for this particular bill was completed in 2014 and uh, it kind of moved forward. And as a result of this bill, uh, there was a change in the federal narrative about how to dispose of drugs. Unfortunately, this also corresponded with the opioid uh, pandemic, I shouldn't say pandemic, maybe it is a pandemic, epidemic. And what you start seeing now is like EPA's response, like this is how you deal with drugs. Uh, don't flush them, but take them back to a, uh, a drug take back location or uh, throw them away. That's great, again, in theory. And then of course, like uh, Food and Drug and Department of Health says, hey, uh, throw them away or take them to a take back location or flush them right away. So the, the challenge we're running into now is the fact with the opioid epidemic, now there's a promotion to actually continue with the, the systems to get the drugs into the water. So it's kind of compounding the issue. So how's this Secure Drug and Disposal Act? Did it really work? And I'm just going to use Idaho as an example. In Idaho, I think there are 24 drug take back locations. And I think that's right, 24, I, I actually took notes. Yeah, 24 retail disposal locations and in 14 counties. And so there are 30 counties that do not have a location at all. And what you'll find is if you go to these drug locations, the disposal boxes are actually full. So you, even if they're, they're there, you still can't take your drugs in. So then people are, are uh, directed to actually throw their drugs away or flush them down the toilet. So again, this is, is really causing a problem. So now what we're seeing is uh, the saved, uh, the Disposal Act was passed in 2010. And one thing that did happen in 2010 too is like EPA initiated, and this again was uh, kind of promoted by Big Pharma that they would do these semi-annual take back events. I think a lot of people have heard about it. These are temporary events. They were supposed to last for four years. And essentially with these events, uh, EPA will promote them, uh, but it was up to the county and local law enforcement or cities and local law enforcement to fund and actually put them on. And uh, just kind of give you an idea, one particular uh, county said, yeah, these are, these are really great, but uh, this EPA event cost my county $15,000 or about $23 per car to put on. And uh, so now you'll start, you see a lot less of these and they're supposed to be temporary. Uh, 2014, the rules were actually finalized, and then uh, what a lot of these governments, local and state governments, found that even with this rulemaking in, and st they were able to, uh, retail facilities were able to actually put in uh, take back locations, they didn't do it because it cost too much, and then they were concerned about safety, especially with the opioid epidemic. Uh, and then, uh, so these local community started putting in a more uh, uh, programs where the pharmaceutical industries would have to pay. So in 2014, the Ninth Circuit Court found that uh, the County of Alameda did have a right to put in a stewardship plan and the pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies would have to pay and that kind of opened the door. In 2016, uh, 10 pharmaceutical drugs were put on the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, fourth uh contaminant uh contender list i think it's what it's called ccl so the concern is now that uh waste and drinking water facilities are going to have to actually treat for these drugs if any of them are actually put on the safe drinking water at and then 2018 the state of washington was the first one that passed a statewide stewardship program so now uh pharmaceutical manufacturers actually have to pay in and fund and put in a program through retail pharmacies for a take back. Uh, and a lot of this is out of concern, of course, the opioid epidemic, but uh, mostly it's, it's the concern about wastewater and drinking water that if it's regulated, there really won't be a way for these, these communities to get it out of the water, at least efficiency, efficiently and economically. So I uh, really flew through this because I think we're at the end, but uh, now I'd like to open it to questions 
a bit about like where it's where this is going and with COVID, what do we think will happen? Any questions? Like drinking through a fire hose, I know. Thanks, Monica. Um, mm -hmm. What do you mean in regards to COVID? Well, what's happening with the, the COVID right now is uh, there's there's been a change in the fact the way pharmaceutical companies and manufacturers are being viewed. Uh, the, the way they were kind of socially constructed before COVID, they were in a way like kind of money hungry, not really caring about the environment and caring about people. But now they're changing their narrative, and you'll you actually notice this in, in some ads that they're here to kind of stop. Uh, the virus. And uh, so I think as a result, just kind of like what we saw with the plastic bag ban, there'll be a push on a federal level to to stop some of these statewide uh, take back programs. Interesting. It's, it's, uh, you're, you're actually seeing that it happen already on a low level. So huh. yeah, they're just like again with the, the plastic bag bans, and uh, what's happening at kind of with the PFOSs and PFASs. So COVID has become like what we call a policy window. Interesting. Yeah. I, I don't think I really grasped in there, why is it that the pharmaceutical companies don't want these things to happen? No, I, well, uh, they don't want to pay for them. Is number, there are two okay. reasons, two main reasons. One, they don't want to pay with, for them. And if one state puts a program in and typically happens, it's going to diffuse to other states. So then they're going to have a patchwork system where they have to pay and manage a take back program. Uh, that's one. And the second is, is like how their drugs are viewed. So right now they're trying to have their drugs viewed as like, you know, it's like, it, and they do help. I don't want to say that pharmaceuticals are all bad, uh, but they're, they're perceived as, you know, a good, a public good. But when you start talking about how they can impact water quality, or impact uh, organisms and impact human health by being in the water, uh, that changes the narrative a bit and they don't want that. They don't want that perception with their product because it's a negative on their product. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really interesting if you start hearing some of their testimony about uh, essentially water quality, and uh, pharmaceutical drugs. It's it's really interesting. Yeah. Monica? Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe this is a simple-minded question, but mm -hmm. I, I actually think taxes have a place in things like this. You know, the drug <laughs> companies, okay, we all know they make buku money, but let's say they don't even make a lot of money. Why couldn't there just be a tax place, placed upon them to cost of doing business type thing, and then they just have to, that money would be taken by the feds or whomever to manage these take backs and get it out of their hands, you know? Well, and yeah, that's a great question. And that actually has been proposed uh, numerous times, like put like a one penny tax on each uh, prescription. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, pharma and the interest groups have fought that tooth and nail. And the, the, the narrative they use is like, well, you know, that's just going to raise the cost of drugs to the elderly and the sick. And so if you put that tax on, you're, that's who you're going to hurt. And that never goes anywhere, or at couldn't least that not Couldn't Big Pharma pay that tax? That's what I'm getting at. I mean, come on. Well, they, yeah, they could. They definitely could. In fact, Oregon, I worked on a project where we were trying to put in a mailback program, kind of like you used to use with Netflix. And I think after the feasibility study and the cost was about $300,000 a year for the entire state of Oregon. And hmm. at Pharma, you know, we put in legislation and Pharma just, they, I'm sure they spent that much money just killing that bill. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's scary. Other questions? No? It's funny, most people ask me about meth gators, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. thanks, Monica and to Austin for both of your talks. This was really great. It was awesome to have um, so many folks on the call since we've all been apart for so long. Um, we are, the board is going to continue um, thinking about different ideas for us to stay connected through all of this. So if anybody on the call has ideas or topics that they're interested in, please email us and let us know. Um, 
if you have any ideas for, for future events and things that you'd like to hear and, and keep an eye out on awraidaho.org uh, for, for future events. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Kendra. Hey, Kathy. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep, I'm back. Yep. Um, <laughs> let me pause the recording.